Okay, um, hello, good, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, my name is Gloria Mills. I'm chair of the TUC Race Relations Committee. I work for Unison, the trade union, and we have a lot of members who have been impacted like a lot of the country with COVID-19. I would like to welcome you to Sunday afternoon and I want to say a huge welcome to our eminent panel of speakers. I will introduce them later on, but also to welcome you for giving up your Sunday afternoon for this discussion on race, COVID-19 and the vaccine. Um, the, the experts you will hear from um, are very um, um, expert in their field about the vaccine development um, and how the COVID-19 vaccine works with the immune system and how the vaccination program is impacting um, Black communities. And when I say Black, we mean um, all of the communities that are, that are impacted, um, the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. There has been a lot of publicity about vaccine hesitancy in the Black communities. Some of us have said that um, there are a lot of assumptions, there are a lot of stereotypes, and there are a lot of propaganda um, being perpetuated um, about um, what the real impact and the real reasons are and why people are not um, opposed to the vaccine, but they do want to have more information. And so um, people um, are asking questions. They're not hesitant. They're not um, skeptical. They're not anti-vaxxers. What they want is to be satisfied of the re information that they're seeking um, to have answered and the questions that they're seeking to have answered. So um, before I, I introduce the, the panel, I just want to, to, to make um, just a quick observation about the kind of questions um, and the kind of issues that have been coming up. Um, some of the things that um, I want to say two things. First, the trade unions, um, we are opposed to mandating of the vaccine. We're opposed to people having to have a vaccine in order to keep their job or to get a job. Um, we think that people's civil liberties, people's rights should be respected, um, as well as um, people should be given the information to make informed decisions. And there are lots of questions about the vaccine and I'll just um, um, raise a few that has been raised with me. People have asked, what is the purpose of the vaccine? It may seem as a basic and obvious question, but people have asked that. What does the vaccine do? Um, and what is its impact? You see, there have been two different um, issues that have come up. We, people have been told that um, the Pfizer vaccine is a messenger RNA vaccine. People want to know what does this messenger um, vaccine do to your immune system? How does it impact the, the cells in your um, um, body? Um, so people are asking issues around um, whether or not they can alter the um, coding, the messenger part of the RNA, um, and what um, impact does it have? Could they change the sequencing of the messenger code? And how does that impact on particular genes? People have raised issues around sickle cell anemia, around thalassemia. What does it do um, to the, the immune system? And whether or not the vaccine is the same um, in terms of how it works, that is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, does it work differently to the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine? And what's the effectiveness of it? What are the potential side effects? Um, how does it work with different variants and emerging variants? And what advice um, should be given to, on pregnancy? and on fertility, but also for people who have conscientious beliefs and objections and religious beliefs about the vaccine and what the contents of the vaccines are. So people want to 
make a decision, but they want to make an informed decision in terms of the vaccine. So those are some of the issues that have been raised with me. And um, I've told you them before so that you could um, give them some consideration and, and address some of those issues um, in order to um, deal with some of the hesitancy. And people have read a lot about the politics, about the low take up in some other countries and high take up in, in, in some countries like the UK. Um, and um, people are just waiting to see what the long-term impact is. And there was the other point about for people is the speed in which the vaccine has been developed, does that actually compromise safety? Um, so those are the, the kind of issues. So without further ado, I will introduce, I think it's better to introduce you as I speak, um, as you um, are due to speak rather than, you know, doing the full um, introduction at the same time. So the first speaker I want to introduce is Dr. Donald Palmer. Um, and um, he's MSc, PhD, PGG, B, PGCAP, FHEA, FRSB, and Associate Professor of Immunology. So I'd like you to, Dr. Palmer, to just um, um, give your take on it, and then we will take any questions that emerge from the discussion. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Gloria. So, firstly, I'd like to thank um, the organizers for inviting not just myself, but Dr. Uh, Wayne Mitchell and, and Dr. William Akar, and they will equally get a, an introduction. And what we plan to do, um, we've got an hour and a half with you. So as again, I'd like to thank the organizers and also like to thank you um, for taking the time to, to listen to us. What we're going to do in a way, and I'm really grateful for um, uh, the chair, Gloria, Gloria Mills, thank you for sending out some of the questions. And in fact, in anticipation of that, we're actually going to do a presentation. So I, I wonder whether or not um, uh, the technical support can actually put our slides up. And, and what we'll do in a way is we'll try and answer many of those questions. But I, I, one of the things I want to stress, we've got an hour and a half. We don't intend to speak on a presentation for an hour and a half. Um, I'm gonna take about uh, sort of maybe 10 minutes. Uh, Wayne will take a similar time and then William. So we, we wanna use the remaining time really to address any questions you have. Um, what, what, I'd, I'm, I'm, what I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about some of the points raised about what is our immune system and really the role of vaccines in general. Okay, uh, Wayne then will talk um, more specifically about COVID-19 vaccine. And then William will talk about it, as, as Gloria mentioned, from um, a, an ethical point of view, a religious point a, a perspective. Um, and what I want to say, first of all, I, mean, I think I can say this with all agreement with my uh, fellow presenters, is the, 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 we recognize, and indeed there are legitimate concerns within the Black and with the BAME community in general. So, um, you know, uh, Gloria's right in saying we should move away from the term, you know, vaccine hesitancy and, and really talk about it, a term that my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Winston Morgan uh, of UEL referred to as vaccine agency. And it's really a case of us having make sure we have the necessary information to make an informed decision. Okay, so I'm not sure if, if the um, technical staff uh, are able to put up the the, the, the slides uh, that we want to present. Um, if if that's not possible, I will continue because we only have an hour, an hour and a half. So um, I will commence while the slides come up, and particularly um, from you know Dr. Mitchell's perspective, because he'll be talking about um, vaccine safety and how the timeline of the vaccine. So I really think it's important, you, you know, if those slides can come up to see from his perspective, that would be really good. But I'll, I'll talk about, you know, the immune system and I can do that without slides because I'm sure we're all familiar with the, the, the um, uh, I think the slides are up. Yeah, the slides are up. Okay, brilliant. Um, I can't see them. So I'm assuming they're up, thank you. So all I have to do is say next slide. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. All right. So thank you. Um, so if we go to the slide where we talk about the immune system, and this is a picture which kind of illustrates how um, our body uh, can get infected, what we call the roots of infection. Okay. So the key thing about um, uh, uh, getting infection is that microorganisms, germs, germs cause disease, whether it's viruses such as flu or whether it's, you know, bacteria that's in, in contaminated food, that's food poisoning or tetanus. You know, if we get cut uh, and we get, you know, infected by a rusty nail. So there's all various, you know, microorganisms that cause disease and we can, they can enter into our body via different routes through contamination of food, um, through the nasal pharynx system, what we breathe in, which is flu, and indeed the current issue with, with COVID, or indeed when our skin is breached. All right, so we, we can get infected with, you know, with all those sort of diseases. And then if we go to um, the, the next slide, what I hope you can see is the fact that um, we have a fantastic immune system. So our innate system consists of many layers. So on the top of the slide, uh, we refer to the frontline defense as innate or natural. That consists of the skin. The skin is an important barrier in terms of infection. Even the tears that are in your eyes actually contain activity that destroy you know, germs, bacteria, viruses, and so forth. You know, even the acid in our stomach provides a level of protection. And even the hairs in our nostril and the mucus that lines both our gut as well as the, the, the lung and the bronchial system is also a form of provider of protection. But if an organism, if a germ breaches that, what we then have next is what we call our antibodies, okay? Our white cells. And you would have heard the term, particularly on newspapers, we talked about antibodies you know, soluble proteins that our body produces. And they are really important. So if I go to the next slide, please. And what I'm hoping you can see on this slide is how viruses uh, actually cause harm. So how viruses work, ladies and gentlemen, is that viruses need to get inside our cells. Virus can't divide outside our cells. They don't have that ability. What they do, they're a bit like a, a thief coming into someone's home. They take everything and then leave, cause destruction. So what they do is they come inside the cell, they can then replicate inside your cells, and by replicating, they cause damage. So how then does our immune system work to actually fight viruses? So we're just talking of just a general infection that many of us have had, flu, for example. We produce antibodies. And as you can see on this slide, what antibodies do is they actually surround the virus and prevent the virus from coming in. It's a bit like, you know, uh, if we still take the analogy of, a, you know, of someone going into someone's house, it's like you've got protection. It's like you've got bouncers on the door whereby, you know, you can't get in, okay? So antibodies are really important. Can I have the next slide, please? Because the next slide is really an important slide that it talks about how our bodies make these antibodies, these very important proteins, the bouncers, uh, as we'll refer to. As you can see from this slide, what you'll see is that how our body makes these soluble proteins it depends on certain things. It depends on how often we've seen this virus. But it, but it also depends on age, obesity, and other factors in terms of the amount of antibodies we produce, okay? So what you'll see is that if we see the virus or the microbe or the germ for the first time, it can take up to a week or so for us to produce these antibodies. But if we see it subsequently or we see it repeatedly, what you'll see are two important things. The antibody levels are produced and the response that we do is far greater, quicker. And in essence, that's what viruses do. And in fact, when you see a virus several times, that's the response you make. And in fact, what vaccines do in a safe way is mimic that response. Next slide, please. 
Because what a virus will do and how vaccines work, and this is specifically about vaccines, is vaccines mimic that immune response. They do so by taking a portion of the germ, of the virus, of the bacteria, a portion that is safe, that doesn't cause disease, but does elicit an immune response so that the body now produces antibodies, so that when you actually do meet that germ, your system has already been primed. It's got those antibodies and it removes the virus. It destroys the bacteria and so forth. And the history of, 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 of vaccines, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has been known for many years. The WHO, and this is the next slide. Let me show you the next slide, which, and some of us may remember these childhood diseases that are around in the 40s and 50s, like measles and so forth, which has practically been eradicated, more or less. And that's because of um, what vaccinations has provided. WHO and other organizations have suggested um, the role of vaccines has been an important one in terms of public health. I've heard this phrase, and I'd like to say it. In addition to clean water, vaccination has been one of the most effective methods of public health. Okay? Uh, and when you look at the longevity of human beings on this planet, you know, over 100 years ago, life expectancy was 40 or 50s because of the various infections. We look at smallpox, which is now eradicated. But life expectancy now is far greater. And that's not just due to vaccination. It's due to the fact of you know, diet and other things. But vaccination has been critically important in that regards. So if I go, I'm just gonna finish off and I've got a couple more slides. And I think the, 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 the next slide is, is around the concept of herd immunity. And really the idea around herd immunity that I wanna tell you about, and herd immunity only works with vaccination. So I've heard the term herd immunity around natural infection. It can't occur with a natural infection because if a disease can kill you, then that's not necessarily the concept of herd immunity. Herd immunity works with vaccination and it works around the concept of the following. When there are many people that, are, that have not had protection, therefore are able to carry the disease as well as get infected, there's so many, the disease can spread. And the concept of us having lockdown in many places around the world is the fact that is to prevent that spread of disease. However, if more and more people get vaccinated, what happens are twofold. One, they get protection, they prevent the spread of the disease. And therefore, if there are only one or two people that have not been vaccinated, what that means is that the opportunity for those people that are not vaccinated to meet is far, far reduced. It's not likely to happen. And therefore you stop the spread of the disease. And the classic example of that, as some of us will be aware, is smallpox. So my last slide is a summary slide that sort of highlights the, the various points, which is around the importance of the immune system, which is vital for our, our protection. And the fact that vaccinations have been used for a long period of time into boost and provide protection to our immune system. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and then I'm going to allow um, uh, Dr. Mitchell from Imperial College to talk about the um, uh, vaccine and the vaccine design, which are really important questions I, I, I think folks have got and um, followed by William, and then we will take any further questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Palmer. And I must say it's the most um, important and simplest way that you know I've ever heard this complex issue in terms of um, protecting um, our immune system explained. And I know a lot of people um, will um, you know, find it very informative and learn a lot. So thank you very much for that. So let me just introduce um, the other two speakers so that um, you can continue with the flow. Dr. Wayne Mitchell is Senior Teacher and Fellow at the Department of Medicine um, at Imperial College London. So thank you very much for being here with us. And Dr. William Acker, um, PhD and Chair of the School of Ethics Committee and Chair of the Decolonizing the, the Academy Collective at Birkbeck College in London. So, you know, 
I won't interrupt the floor. You can continue, both of you. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting us to um, attend this um, session of the TUC conference for the Black um, workers, etc. It's a real privilege for us to be here. And as my colleague Donald Palmer has said, it's we look at this as almost like a public service because it's something that we need to be able to communicate clearly to individuals who need the information. So if I could start with my first slide, which just asked the question effectively, um, let's talk about the COVID-19 vaccination and the black community. Should I take the vaccine? Yes or no? There's a lot of questions, as Gloria had um, highlighted at the start, there's a lot of questions that um, are within the community and people would like to have some kind of information, as Donald has said, that will help them to make that decision. It is a key decision um, and one that cannot be taken lightly. So if we move to the next slide, what you can, I like the way that Donald had introduced this concept of vaccine hesitancy. Is it hesitancy or is it about agency? Agency is the ability for us to make informed decisions, not based on fear. Um, and so what we want to do is to understand the rationale behind what may be causing people to be hesitant. So if we click to the, click through, please, um, one of the things which you'll notice is about the idea about the lived experience of many black people in the National Health Service. The statistics which have come out have shown that pain scores are considered higher. There's higher mortality of black women when in childbirth. And when we look at a number of different factors, you can always see that it always appears that um, black people are lower down. The service that they receive seems to be poorer compared to their white um, counterparts. So their lived experience suggests that, is, it, is there equity within this system? You also then have ideas about things like social media and the concepts which come out from social media, the conspiracy theories. There's no such thing as COVID, it's 5G they've aborted fetuses etc we've all heard them and there are always um questions which are asked surrounding these things so the idea is well can we counteract some of these things could we go to the next just click to the next one please uh, yep the next one we have is about how the gap the government or the governmental handling of black issues in general we know about the inequalities, we've seen, we've understood, we've got recent um, evidences, things like the Windrush scandal, which always highlight that the way that the government may well handle these issues may not be in the favor of black people. And therefore there will always be this level of concern. Could we click to the next please? And there's also the historical um, perspective of the abuses of black bodies. We only have to think about the um, American trials of syphilis in Tuskegee and also the Henrietta Lacks in the 1950s where they took her cells and made billions without even informing the family. And even early in the pandemic last year where there was the um, conversation or was reported of two French scientists saying, well, let's test the vaccine in Africa almost as if to say, well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that that's what they were saying, but the perception is there. So we have to consider those things very carefully. If we could click to the next one, which is also, I think, the one of the things which is very fearful for a lot of people. How come the vaccine was developed so quickly? Okay, we know that vaccines, this was a the media has been telling us this is a new vaccine, this, sorry, a new virus. So how were they able to develop a vaccine for this new virus in such a short space of time, less than a year, right? 
So all of these things, if you don't know what the answers are, it's going to cause you to wonder about your own agency. Can I do this? Can we click to the next slide, please? Oh, go back one there. Thank you. Um, with this slide, I just want to show a comparison. The first um, chart which you can see, you can see this first chart was um, in February um, 20, 2021, this year, 20, um, February this year. And what we can see is when we look at the take up of the vaccine, we can see that amongst the black community, it is much lower, okay, than than all of the other populations or all of the other demographics. Um, that, and that goes across all of the different age ranges. If we move forward onto the second, the second part of the slide, which was just taken um, last week, we can see there is an improvement, but still there is this lack of take up within the black community. So the question is, is how can we improve that and increase that because the, we need to have a, a higher take up. If we can move to the next slide, please. So for me, I think this is about an issue of trust. The issue of trust related to, can we trust how well the vaccine has been developed, the vaccine development process? Can we trust that it will protect us, All right? Are there any long-term impacts which will be on our bodies? And then there's other things which are, are, as I said, with regards to things like the governmental handling and also biotech companies, can we trust them? Okay, I'm not going to go into too much detail with trust in the government because I'm not going to play politics here. Um, and with the biotech companies, again, I'm not going to focus on those aspects, but I will focus on the first three, which is about vaccine development, the vaccine protection and the long term impact on the body. OK, so if we could have the first the, the next slide, please. So vaccine de development, how so fast and is it safe? If we can click for the first click, please. Could we just move it forward slightly? Yeah. So one of the things which we do know is that technology has been advancing and the advancement of technology has meant that um, you can move things along quickly. I just want to illustrate the idea about a carrier pigeon and a mobile phone. So if you can click to the next slide so I can, or the next part. If we look at this little timeline, Back in the days, we used to have drawings on on the um, on cave walls, etc. Then we had the carrier pigeon, which was able to communicate or get messages from one place to another in oh well, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, depending on how far it was. All right? If we move forward to the likes of Facebook and Twitter, we can have messages sent from one per one area one geographical area to another geographical area across the world within seconds so the rate at which communication has um in been enhanced by technology means that we can have transfer of information at a much quicker speed now when we if we use that similar kind of analogy if we click through two slides please um if we use that similar kind of analogy, what you can then see is that because we've got greater technology, the ability to um, the ability to identify pathogens um, such as the, the um, SARS-CoV-2 um, as and then find specific targets, i.e., the spike protein. Okay, it's a combination of better technology enabling better resources to be found and to be moved on quickly. So if we can click to the next part, please. What we can see is we've got both technology and knowledge. Technology and knowledge, the two combined. So with better knowledge of the immune system as 
um, Dr. Palmer, Donald has said earlier on, as we understand the immune system better, we can then find better ways of treating the aspects of the virus which is trying to invade the immune system. So when we think about something like the um, SARS-CoV-2, it's a new variant of a common foe. And that common foe is a coronavirus. Now, actually, the first case of a coronavirus was back in 2000 and, um, 2002, November 2002. So although the SARS-CoV-2 was a new variant, we actually knew about um, coronaviruses for the past 17 years. So the makeup of the viruses, how they operate, was understood, scientists understood it. Another thing which has enabled us to work more effectively is collaboration, not competition. Oftentimes, in, in so many walks of life, it's more about a competition, who can get there first. In this case, because everybody recognized the seriousness, there was an intense amount of collaboration. And that, I believe, has led to um, why the, the part of the speed of the, the whole process. If we could click through to the next part, please. So we've got global collaboration. What we can see is that we've got over 180 research laboratory, laboratories, 100 biotech companies, and $24 billion of investment. So we've got a combination of collaboration, not competition. We've got the manpower um, all working together with investment to propel the, um, propel the target forward, uh, to meet our target aim. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. And then that means um, in total, we've got over 77 different um, COVID-19 vaccines, which are currently in some stage of development across the globe. Not just the three that we know about, 77, okay? So if we could go to the next slide, I just want to summarize what I've said in these next two things, because why was the speed, why was it so speedy to, to develop? If we click through very quickly, um, what we can see is that we've got in a conventional cycle, you'd possibly have low manpower, only two or three um, groups may be working on a particular vaccine. You'd have low investment and Oh, trying to get funding to do research can be a really tricky thing. So when you've got low investment, low manpower, this wheel of knowledge and um, technology um, cycle takes time. And in addition to that, you have to then think about how you recruit the patients um, who you're going to test the, the system on um, for your clinical trials. And hence, that can result in uh, eight to 10, maybe even 15 years before you'll get a new vaccine approved. So if we fast forward to what happened in this situation, if we click through to the next one, please, what we had is high manpower, a high level of investment. So this kind of like circle, the knowledge and the transfer uh, and the, um, technology was very quick. In addition, when we, they were recruiting, they had lots of individuals who volunteered to take part. So there was still the statistical power to say that the safety and all of those concerns, the efficacy were all being done simultaneously, not one after the other, which is the normal process. So hence, the speed at which this long phase um, of the approval process would normally take, as I said, eight to 10 years. This time it took about eight to 10 months. And hence the reason why we have a new approved or series of new approved vaccines in such a short space of time. 
So if we could click to the next slide, please. So the key things with this are the funding, a massive investment. You've got the manufacturing where because everybody was so focused on getting the vaccine prepared and getting the vaccine out, there was no um, barriers to, 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 to the time at which um, and resources which were placed um, to get the vaccine development. You had thousands, tens of thousands of keen volunteers who wanted the vaccine, who wanted to do their part and contributed to it. The science and the, the collaboration within the science um, was astounding. The amount of information which was published and passed on between scientific groups meant that that knowledge transfer was very, very rapid. Every week there was new developments which people were sharing, whereas previously it would have been, I've got this new information, I'm going to be one step ahead of the competition. There was no competition, it was about collaboration. Okay, so if you want to find out a little bit more, I would say go to the BSI, so that's the British Society for Immunology. They have some really good resources where you can actually find out a bit about how the whole vaccination development process is. And there's a link um, at the bottom. If we could have the next slide. So the next stage, which I want to, uh, us to kind of like think about is this idea about the vaccine protection and what it does. So. As I said earlier on, we've got we've had hundreds of thousands of people from different places in the world, different continents, and um, blacks, whites, Hispanics, and um, Asians, who have volunteered to test the different um, vaccines. And so, as a result of that, what we're able to, what they're then able to do is to um, have a safety profile of the vaccine. They know the things which are likely to have happened because they've been able to test it on many people who had already volunteered. And that included people from all demographics. So if we move to the next slide, please. The, vi the vaccine itself if we could just click on one slide, please. Yeah. The vaccine itself doesn't protect you from being infected or transmitting COVID-19. Okay. That's not the type of protection that we're, we're dealing with here. What the vaccine does, if we can click to the next slide, is that it provides prior exposure to, a, to the harmless element of the virus. Okay. Which enables the immune system, which... Donald had spoken about, to respond much faster when it does then encounter the harmful virus. So it's able to see it, recognize it much quicker, and then the body is, goes into full, full working mode, right? And, and fights off that infection, okay? And the, the speed at which it does that is key and important to you developing that level of immunity. So if we could click to the next part, please. All right, so the vaccine reduces the severity of the infection, therefore preventing the serious symptoms of the infection. So you may still feel as though you'll become ill if you, you get it, but it will still not be as severe as it may have been had you not had the vaccination. So in the long term, this helps in the reduction of hospital admissions, right? And it also um, reduces the level of restrictions, i.e. the lockdown and the social distancing measures which are currently in place. Because effectively, the lockdown and the social distances are trying to prevent the transmission. They're trying to prevent the infection. By having the vaccine, this is an alternative way of, of um, reducing transmission and infection. If we could go to the next slide, please. 
So what is the long-term impact on our bodies? Okay, if we click through. Well, most adverse effects of, uh, of vaccines um, appear at the time of vaccination or within a couple of days or a couple of weeks of the um, time when you get the in infection. Sorry, the vaccination, right? Now, as we've said earlier on, there has already been thousands of individuals um, who have been tested by the, who have had the vaccination. And in having that vaccination, if we could just click through two slides, two parts, please. Okay. These individuals have been monitored for months without having raised significant major concerns um, since having the vaccine. OK, so that suggests with so many people having had the vaccine and not coming down with any adverse effects, that the safety precautions are quite good. As of Friday, uh, I think I was listening to the news this morning. They're saying that over 50 percent of the UK population has now received the first dose of the vaccine. Now, if that's over 50 percent, and I think if my maths is right, it's was about 70 million people. That's about 35 million people in the UK alone have had a vaccine. OK, and we are not seeing a huge increase in the number of side effects being reported. But what we are seeing is a reduction in hospital admissions. And we're seeing a reduction in the number of cases being reported and the daily deaths from the vaccination, from um, infections with COVID-19. If you could click to the next slide, please. What I wanted to highlight is, again, this, this booklet, which goes into the, a guide for um, vaccinations of COVID-19. Um, there's also, the slides will be made available, um, and there is a couple of videos which goes with it, which I think would be quite useful for you to have a look at and see. I'm going to just skip to the next slide. And I've deliberately said, who can we trust? Now, I've got on here a number of individuals. So we've got Patrick Vernon, who um, took the, Os the Oxford vaccine in January. And, you know, he's been prominent with regards to the Windrush scandal and looking at inequalities. We've got a series of black MPs. We've got Asian MPs and celebrities who have united in putting out um, why you should take the the vaccine and why it's good to take the vaccine. We've also got Donald Palmer. I think it was just two weeks ago, Donald also had his vaccine to, to demonstrate it is important that we take this vaccine. So if I could just move to the last slide, I believe my last slide. All right. This is just a resource list of where you can find some more um, information, trusted information as to the whole vaccine process, the whole um, addressing COVID-19 and why it is that we should be, um, con not concerned, but why we should be promoting and should be encouraging the uptake of vaccination. So I'm going to hand over to William. Uh, thank you, Wayne, and um, thank you, Donald. I'll be briefer than my um, colleagues because I will speak more into the theological and ethical and political dimensions of this um, issue. So you can put up um, my slide um, there. Thank you. So Wayne said he didn't really want to enter into the political, but I think these questions are eminently political, that racism kills. And that's the context that we much put these questions around COVID-19. A uh, colleague of mine, Professor David Williams, Professor of African-American Studies, Public Health at Harvard, done extensive research that really outlines that racism kills. So more than any other factor, 
that impacts black and brown bodies in the Western hemisphere, even if you take into consideration education, social class, race is predominant factor that will lead you to have an earlier death than your white counterparts in the Western hemisphere. So that I think is the context then when we begin to ask questions about the nature of COVID-19 and then what is our response. And given the history of, as Wayne outlined, enslavement, colonialism, second class treatment, that's the context in which we come into when we discuss these issues of viruses and our response to them. So then how do we then respond? And in some ways, as we've always responded, gives us advantages and vulnerabilities. So it's our ability to come together as communities that have given us resistance to ask different questions from the mainstream that enables us to survive and to pull through, but also sometimes makes us vulnerable when we become enclosed in our communities and we don't examine all the voices that we need to hear to make informed decisions because we closed ourselves off because we might be suspicious of the wider information. But there are some, in a sense, theological tips, ethical tips that we can learn and gather from. If you don't mind, in the book of Acts, for example, Acts 17, 11, it talks about two communities, the, the Bereans and the Thessalonians. And it tells us that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they examined every day to see whether what the evangelist Paul was saying was true. Even though these people were believers, they still had a system by which they were evaluating the evidence or the voices that were being given to them. So we too need to evaluate and weigh up the evidence. Just as much as we scrutinize and they're gonna ask us questions about the medical efficacy and all of those questions, and that's right, you need to do that. In the same way then, you need to ask questions, weigh up the evidence of the videos that you may be listening on YouTube when somebody sends you a WhatsApp. Are you giving those the same level of scrutiny and detail to see whether those actual things are true? Secondly, as I say, we need to think about the bigger picture and what that means for us as black and brown peoples in the UK. Do we have that broader concern for our communities? Again, Old Testament prophet Jeremiah speaks these words. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Why then is there no healing for the wounds of my people? I think it as trade unionists, as people concerned about our community, that's the question that we want to ask. Why is there no healing for the wounds of my people? Why is it that we were the most vulnerable to this disease, that when we catch it, we are more likely to die? And where were the authorities? Where were the government in relation to us then when they knew these things? Why were we not being shielded better than other communities? Why were furloughs and extensions not being given to us to the same rates as they were to other communities? That these are essentially issues of justice. And it can't be that the government runs after us, take the vaccine, take the vaccine, and expects trust when they didn't rush and say, ah, oh, you were catching it in more numbers, let's protect you, let's shield you as, as citizens of the country that we care about and value, let's do all that that we can. No, they just want to rush now because it's useful to them in that regards to have the vaccine. And that's not to say don't take the vaccine. As I say, it's about weighing up the evidence. 
And we know that in a sense, government's views in a way haven't really changed around these issues. They trumpet this idea, isn't it? No one's safe until everyone is safe. But actually, you look at the evidence, you look at how Western Hemisphere governments are hoarding vaccines, you look how they're engaged in white on white trade wars, the European Union against the UK in relation to, to vaccines. That tells us that no one's safe until the white capitalist infrastructure is safe. That's what they really mean. But actually, then they, one might argue that there are learned lessons that one can learn from that. That might say, actually, the fact that they are hoarding the vaccine in such numbers, that means that actually, for them, they think it's safe because they want to protect that capitalist system at all costs. And they're not then rushing to send it to Africa, to Asia, to other places in the so-called um, global, they're not sending it to the global south, they're hoarding it for themselves. So that might as well give us some clues. So I think then there's, to end, for me then there's that challenge, that the need for a truth and justice reckoning, that given what's happened in this year, the health pandemic that has disproportionately impacted black and brown bodies, the racism pandemic and George Floyd that has disproportionately impacted black and brown bodies, that now there is a time for us to come together as communities to demand justice and to demand health equality for all our communities, but particularly those communities that have been continue to be disproportionately impacted by both the disease of COVID and the curse of racism. So as Martin Luther King was very fond of quoting, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never ending stream. Our cause against racism is just, and we must continue to fight that fight, even as we continue to look to improve healthcare for all our communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. And um, thank you um, to Dr. Mitchell and to Dr. Eckert and to Dr. Palmer. You have comprehensively dealt with all of the issues that have come up. Um, from members of the Race Relations Committee, from the Black communities, um, and also so a lot of the issues that people have expressed concerns about. And I think um, Dr. Mitchell talked about the issue of trust. Um, and that was, that is so important because um, I think it's part of our history and the lived experience. Um, and a lot of people say, in, in looking at what Dr. Acker has said in terms of the um, issues around, you know, how we respond, you know, um, gives us advantages as well as make us more vulnerable. Um, a lot of people have said, you know, that um, our survival is because we resist. And we resist by asking questions that other people do not want to ask. And that links to the issue of trust. Some people have no need to ask questions because they haven't got the same lived experience as black people. And they haven't had to deal with the impact of racism in their day-to-day -day lives. And that goes back to this issue of trust. Who do you trust? Do you trust the government? Do you trust um, people in the medical profession who made you believe sometime you do not have an issue when you talk about pain? Because as a black person, you're supposed to have a higher tolerance of pain. Um, and you know, so black people say to me that um, 
they have had really difficult experiences and that's why they have to navigate um, the information that they are being provided with because our experience of trust is, you know, trust is when you see the good in people. So the majority of people don't need to ask any questions because they always see the good. But black people's lives have been to see the bad and the ugly. So black people have to protect themselves um, from the bad and the ugly until they see the good. And the way you see the good in terms of trust is to have the information, to ask the questions, to um, weigh up the evidence that you are being given and you are being provided with. Um, and also, you know, to come to a place where you see the good of the government, of the big pharmaceuticals, and of the people who are selling it to you. The fact that a lot of people are coming on to um, encourage people to take it. As a black person in the black community, that does not wash with a lot of people in our community. Some of the disparaging comments you will hear, um, they make, you know, it's, you know, if some, if they were to see some of the people, and I hear it from the older generation, people in their 80s who will not take the vaccine who have lived through, you know, their ancestors' experience of racism and, and coming out of slavery and imperialism. And they would tell you, it doesn't matter, you know, who you are in terms of your status. It's, you know, the black, per black people recognize your status if they trust the good in you as well. And if they don't see you as promoting someone else's agenda. So I think we all, we have to navigate some of these issues. And you have, the three of you today have really touched on those issues. Those are the issues people are asking. Those are the issues people want answers to in our community. And I, I really think it's important um, that um, they weigh up the advantages and the vulnerabilities but you know, they don't give trust to people who do not earn that trust. And this is what our community is demanding, that the people who are selling the efficacy, the safety and the importance of the vaccine um, have that credibility. And I'll give you one example. Last June, when the Public Health England report was due to come out, the government sat on the report for a number of weeks. People had to um, demand that the report is produced. People felt that, you know, what was being hide or what, what was being hidden rather, what did they have to hide? Um, and when the disproportionate deaths were being, and, and hospitalization and deaths from hospitalizations were coming out, there was no quick response. Um, and, and that PHE, report was being suppressed. And then you came to the vaccine and then people felt, well, no, this is a cultural war. This is an attack on black people. It's about, it's per, um, perpetuating stereotypes. It's perpetuating assumptions and it's, it's like a propaganda war. So that's how our community viewed it because the same um, speed in terms of selling the vaccine was not, used to protect lives. So, um, so you have to see it from our community seeing the bigger picture and having to ask those questions. And so you have really so, um, answered and dealt with some of a lot of those concerns and you have given people the information of where to look for it. People are still, you know, navigating their way through this issue. And I think if you look in, it's not just in the UK, if you look in America, in the USA, um, the same questions are being asked, the same issues are being debated. And I think we need to continue to have this debate and this um, these questions raised um, because it's about um, the price of progress is eternal vigilance. And having been taught that, you know, our survival 
depends on asking the right questions at the right time and also resisting being told things that have not been proven or um, having evidence to support it um, makes you more determined to get answers to those questions. So I, you have covered all of this. I really am delighted with that and we will open for questions. I'm not I'm sure there will be a lot of questions in the chat, but you, you have really um, um, inspired um, people to ask those questions. And it's good to have um, doctors and people in the scientific and medical world encouraging that kind of open discussion around um, the efficacy of the vaccine, the safety of it, and um, how it protects us as people. Um, having to look through the ethics of racism, of colonialism, of slavery, of imperialism, and every ism that's going. So it's so important that you know we just don't take what's sold to us. In fact, my in fact, my 11-year-old nephew have asked more questions about the vaccine um, and about you know um, the need to ask those very salient questions. And he's saying, well, you know, you cannot take it unless you are satisfied that these issues have been answered. So it's really important that you're doing this work. So I'll open it up now to questions. I'm not sure whether well, who is whether the questions are in the chat or whether they're coming through from you, Will. Oh, there's you a, know, there's a raise hand. There's a raise hand for a question. I'm not Gloria, sure. Who Gloria, if you look at your email. Email. Um, where is it? Um, Have you got your email open? No, no, I haven't got my email. I've got the chat, but I, I can... No, open up your email and you'll see I've put a load of questions. Oh, the email. Oh. Okay. Um, okay, let me... Come. I don't think I have to come out, have I? Um... There was just... While you're looking through your email, there was just one point which I would like to make. And being a kind of like pseudo-immunologist, Donald's the, the, the true immunologist, but there is this concept called immune surveillance, Okay where your body is constantly um, going round, looking for pathogens, okay? Um, a, a pathogen, a germ, a, a something which shouldn't be there. And then it, as soon as it detects it, it sends out a signal, okay? And Gloria, as you were speaking and talking about the vigilance that we need to have, that's effectively what the, the, the body does. It's 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 being vigilant in searching out the truth, which feeds into the point which William was making about questioning all the facts, all the data, so that you then are satisfied that taking the vaccine or um, taking the vaccine is the right thing for you to do, okay? There are gonna be different factors, which will mean that for some people, taking the vaccine or taking a certain type of vaccine wouldn't be right for them. Whereas other people, it would be right for, for example. So I just wanted to illustrate that point based on what you had said. Okay, okay thank you very much. Okay, let me try. I've got so many questions, but I'd put these three whilst I go back and, and go into the email and look again. Um, one question was, what are the best websites for fact-checking um, conspiracy theories on, 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 on the vaccine? How many pandemics? That's the first one. How, the second one, how many pandemics um, um, are major health issues um, and have been prevented from spreading due to the vaccine worldwide? And are there, are there any... Um, are there any records of the percentage of people who have, um, who, okay, yeah, it's about how many, are there any percentage um, of people um, who have taken the vaccine have died in connection with the vaccine having received it um, within a few days in the BAME community in the UK? 
Um, is there any research on the vaccine for the black community and the safety of taking this? And if so, what is the percentage of this that has been tested on the black community? What percentage of the vaccine has been tested on the black community? That's a common one that comes up. People say the vaccine has been tested in Brazil, it's been tested in South Africa, but you know um, they cannot find the information about the proportion of black people it was tested on um, um, in America as well as the UK. And um, you know what have been the impact on them? And at what's the age group as well, the demography in terms of um, the test on the vaccine. There was an, and there's another question, has there been any studies on the number of people that have died after taking the two doses of the vaccine? Um, because you know um, some people have taken the first dose of the vaccine and we know in some European countries um, like Denmark and Finland, they have still got the suspension on the use of the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, that's the initial ones. There are quite a few more. So if you could- shall we, shall we answer some of those? Yes, and then I'll come back with the others later. Yeah. So, so I may have forgotten those, but I will try. I've written, written them down. So um, in, in terms of how many people have died taking the vaccine, in the UK, the answer is zero at the moment, okay? So uh, Wayne pointed out um, the, the, the millions of people that have taken it in the UK. Um, there have been side effects, and the side effects I think I should point out are the side effects that would normally occur when the body's making an immune response, okay? So the side effects aren't something which is unusual. So for example, you know, you might get fever. I should point out, that's actually a body's response to an infection. Because what's quite interesting is when the body increases its temperature, it's actually a mechanism that slows the growth of germs. Clearly, obviously, if, if the fever persists, that could be problematic. But the initial response of an increasing temperature is actually related to an infection. In terms of the vaccination, so far, um, there is no one that have had severe adverse effects in the UK. With regards to the situation in, um, in Den Denmark and other parts of Europe where I think they've now removed that ban, the figures are that the level of blood clotting that's seen in the general population is very much the same as those that have been vaccinated. And it's not clear whether or not vaccination per se was the trigger for the blood clotting, all right? But equally, it should be said that I know in this country, and I'm, I know it in other countries, is that um, if you are currently taking, say, antibiotics, if you're currently taking certain blood thinners, you'd be advised not to take the vaccine. So I know uh, when you go to, when folks go to their GP to explain their clinical history, and it's really important you do that, your GP will then advise whether or not to take the vaccine. So that's really important um, because they currently do that at the moment. Now, with regards to, um, and I'll let Wayne and others come in, and with regards to uh, the clinical trials, um, it, it should be pointed out that um, this is a really difficult, challenging question. And I wanna take it from two case, two fronts. It has been clinically trialed on a wide variety of the population, okay? But I think we need to be careful uh, as ethnic minorities to insist that there may be a difference to how we respond than to others. We, are, we need to be careful because we could be treading on the, on the route of eugenics, right? So it's really important that, that, that we're very careful in how we, are, we answer that. I do agree that you know, in terms of making sure that the vaccine is, is you know, in clinical trials is actually used on a wide diverse population. And in fact, the clinical trials started from the age of 18 all the way up to older individuals. 20% are, are of the Moderna trial and indeed of the AstraZeneca trial were people who actually had underlying 
uh, diseases, cardiac disease, obesity, etc. So they actually were reflecting the general public, which I think is, is more important, but equally in terms of ethnicity. Okay, because they because remember ethnicity is a social construct. There's no genes associated, so it's really important that that we get that across. I think the key word we should be asking is representation, mm -hmm. which is important. Uh, and I know the clinical trials were were, were done uh, in the early stages um, in you know in Africa, in Brazil, and so forth. But we should also point out, and Wayne made this, I think, really important case that don't forget, uh, amongst the BAME community, there's hundreds of, already, thousands of people already been taking the vaccine. <laughs> okay, the, the the rates may not be as high as we want, but nevertheless. Several thousands of people from ethnic minorities have currently taken the vaccine. Um, yeah, I I agree with what Donald said there, a hundred percent. There's a couple of things which I'll just follow up on. One of the questions was, where do you um, get information, the statistics? The statistics you have to always be a little bit careful with them, right? But with statistics, if you do go to the Office for National Statistics it will give you a weekly breakdown of the, the current position. So if we look at, for example, in the different age ranges, what we will see is the number of deaths within those different age ranges from the 80, 80 plus, the 70 plus. Oh, since January, we've seen an 85% reduction in the number of cases within those age ranges, which are, having to go into hospital or resulting in, in death. So there's a, there is a decline since the vaccination process has been, and it's a combination of the vaccination process plus the lockdown. There's, it's never just one factor mm. which is going to be responsible. There are going to be several factors which are involved. It's, and, and that's the same thing when we're referring to to any deaths, okay? It may well be that there may seem to be an increased number of deaths, but many of these people who may well be dying may have underlying health conditions, which means that they are going to be more susceptible than other individuals. So you have to, you have to take it really on a case by case basis, not necessarily clumping everything together, okay? Um, that would be the points which I would make on on that. Um, with regards to there was another, as as Donald had said, there has been a number of um, black people, Asian people who have already taken the taken the vaccine, and we are not seeing an increased reports of of um, death or side effects from those communities. Um, Donald also made a very good point about the fact that it's not just, it's not a necessarily, the virus doesn't come across and say, what, when, when it's released from one host and it's floating through the air and it sees a black person, an Indian person, a white person. It says, oh, let me go to the black person because I'm, I know I'm going to have a better effect in there than I will with the... It doesn't do that. It's, <laughs> it's not that intentional, okay? It will go in and it's other societal and underlying soci socioeconomic um, and, so, and um, racial inequalities, which are the things which are most likely to result in um, differential outcomes. There was, I don't want to plug anyone, but David Hayward, Hayward did a documentary um, uh, a few weeks ago. If you want to have a look at some of the other underlying factors, why um, within the black community it might be more prevalent, I would recommend go and have a look at that um, video um, on the BBC. Um, it does highlight a number of factors which you have to take into consideration. I'm going to stop there and, and 
allow any more questions. Oh, there are so yeah. many questions. It's like a, I'm trying to, ha I'm having to um, um, decide for which ones um, come out now. Um, it's um, okay. I see. Um, right. There's one here. Um, um, I'm not, I wouldn't call the names of the people who have asked the questions. I just think um, they didn't say they want their names to be read out. So I'll just ask the question. Someone knows a friend whose family all had COVID. One brother passed away. Um, the friend had va the vaccine in January and after four weeks, he developed COVID-19 again. Mm -hmm. um, that's um, one of the questions. The other one, the other one um, is that, um, um, to, for clarity, is, um, are you saying that COVID-19 has been around since 20, 2002? Right. Um, so, and, the, and there was a question that um, when I mentioned about the point, the difference between the Pfizer vaccine, which works on the mRNA system, um, process and the um, the AstraZeneca one, which um, works on a different process. I forgot the name now, viral something. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Um, anyway, but what, 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 um, it, could you um, clarify um, the difference between um, the mRNA and gene editing? Because yes. it's, um, um, I think that seems to be um, one of the issues yeah. we, um, that people keep asking about, you know, because some people in some journals have linked the same mRNA vaccine with things that with solving things like sickle cell anemia and gene editing. So, and it's there, raised- there, there, there's, there's differences um, and, and some similarities, but mainly difference, but I, I can answer that. Let, Wayne, you may want to comment on the COVID 2002 story, but, but yeah. let me comment on the, the, the Pfizer messenger RNA and the AstraZeneca. So, so, so I, I want, there's certain, certain biological principles that I think is really important. Messenger RNA cannot, <laughs> this vaccine cannot alter your DNA. So let's make it clear. Cannot alter your DNA. It's physically, biochemically impossible. Equally, um, I want to make it clear that these vaccines um, have not involved any use of any animal products. So there's no gelatin, no pork, or anything inside them. And in fact, um, I know um, a few months ago, the various Muslim imams have actually produced a fact sheet with this information in. And again, similarly, the design in terms of using fetal cells, no. So, so I just wanna make those points because I think that's really important. Now, how, the, how messenger RNA works, think of it as the analogy, it's, it's basically a message. So think of it in a way um, uh, that, think of a cookbook. And I think, I think it was Wayne or someone else who came up with this really nice analogy. So, so think of the cookbook as DNA. And then if you made a photocopy of a recipe for chocolate cake, you made that photocopy, that is the message. So when you then start preparing the, the ingredients and making the cake, that's the product, okay? And that's basically how, you know, how genetics work. DNA, i.e. the book, has got all the information. You make a photocopy, that's the message, because you don't want to dirty up the book with all the flour and stuff. And then the product of the cake is the protein. And you know when you make a photocopy, it can't go, it can't go back into the book. You've already got it. So that's the 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 that's what we call the, the message. And in terms of that vaccine, it contains a very small amount of a message. And that message just make a small amount of protein that you know Wayne sp spoke about in the spike protein. That's very different to the AstraZeneca. The AstraZeneca is basically, they've just used a, a vector, a, basically a, a, like a viral vector in fact. And basically it contains the information that contains a part of the viral uh, 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 spike protein. So it's a different process. Um, but I should point out that the concept of messenger RNA vaccine, although it's the first one that's been used, messenger RNA vaccines were, were around in the 90s. And I remember when, when I was teaching medical students and vet students, um, you know, about different types of vaccines, I, I remember discussing 
you know, um, uh, the idea that um, they may be starting to use different types of vaccines. And I should point out before Wayne comes in, one of the reasons why people were making these types of vaccines, because they're different types. One of the concerns people had is, you know, you can actually have a vaccine which contains a small part of the germ or the virus or the bacteria, or you could use the entire germ, but you kill it. Or what you could do is use the, the germ itself, but you grow it in a way so it doesn't cause disease. It's the term attenuated. Mm -hmm. And the problem people had was if you use an attenuated strain, it could revert. And equally, the concern was that even in pa patients who are immunocompromised, would you still want to give a live vaccine? And, in, and that's why people were generating more safer vaccines. So in essence, a messenger RNA vaccine is probably one of the most safest type of vaccines that are currently being used in, 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 in us today. Yeah, I'd agree. Wayne, you, you may want to pick up about the question about COVID. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up that question of, there was two questions I'll pick up on. There was one statement which was made about the person who's, the entire family seemed to come down with COVID and then um, one of the uncles passed away and then somebody else got reinfected after having the vaccination. The vaccination doesn't prevent you from getting the, from becoming infected again, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't prevent that. What it does do is it means that your immune response will recognize the invading pathogen much quicker. OK, and because it's able to recognize it much quicker, it can mount an effective response much faster, therefore preventing the escalation and the increase in the symptoms which you might then get. OK, so the vaccine itself will not prevent you from getting infected. That's not its purpose. The purpose is to reduce the effect of the virus because you've had prior exposure to it. That's the whole idea of, of vaccination, right? So that's one. Um, with regards to um, was COVID-19, it, was it a new virus or was it a new variant? of a known virus, right? The first time that we encountered coronaviruses or the first reported cases was in, in um, the date was 16th of November, 2002, okay? And it was SARS and it went all around um, Asia, the SARS pandemic in Asia, okay? And the Chinese learned how to deal with it. It didn't come across to the Europe and to the West. It just predominantly stayed in, in, in the Chinese and Asian continents, okay? But we have known then about the general makeup of these coronaviruses, okay? So when a new variant, so it's much the same way that every year you get vaccinated for influenza. Influenza, we know the basic construct of influenza, okay, but it will change slightly. It will be modified slightly. And in those modifications which you get, those are the things which then make the virus either more um, pathogenic or make it more harmless. OK, so what's actually happened here is somewhere along the line, the COVID or the, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, it's changed, it's mutated slightly, which has meant that it's become much more virulent, much more aggressive in its response. OK, so we still know what the basic outline of the coronaviruses are. OK, but we just need to identify what is that modification and what is the modification doing when it gets into the body. 
And so if you already know the basic blueprint, we can sequence it very quickly, we can identify the mutations, and then we can design things specifically targeted to address that mutant variant. Does that make sense? Actually, just want to make a point, a really good point Wayne made in, 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 in terms of the vaccine. And this is really important. And this data has just recently come out both from Public Health England and Public Health Scotland. So the data is available. Um, and Wayne's right that the vaccine may not prevent folks from getting um, COVID, although there's evidence that it's slowing the transmission. But the key thing, what the evidence is now showing is the fact that it's lowering the severity of disease. Uh, and the study came out recently, and Wayne touched on this, and I think it's really key that, you know, COVID is having an impact, particularly uh, on the older community. And what the data is now showing, because they were the first group that were getting vaccinated, and both that and the lockdown, you're seeing less severe cases of COVID. And that's really an important point. Um, so as Wayne said, uh, the, the vaccine is, is priming or making your immune system fit mm -hmm. so that when you do see the virus, you're able to deal with it quickly. Because one of the impacts, and which is a concern, is, is uh, how COVID is, uh, can actually have an impact, but also long-term COVID as well. Okay, that is really important. I see we are now at 15.31 and it's Sunday and some of you might want to have your rice and peas like me <laughs> and other things. But um, I just want to say it, you know, I have had, there's been so many questions I've not been able to ask, but I think it's really um, important that I, um, some people have asked if the slides will be available. I think it was said, yes, the slides will be made available. Um, we also, um, there have been a lot of issues around the, tree, um, the lack of um, regulation in terms of the CQC because some, there have been a lot of complaints about black patients, especially people who have had and who had diabetes, a lot of them were denied water, vitamin and oxygen and different things and the first wave um, um, and the second wave of the um, pandemic and the, and the lack of PP for black um, um, staff, but that will be the subject of an independent public inquiry. We are gathering evidence for that. So um, I, um, none of you doctors have to answer that. Um, but we've had lots of um, um, questions about COVID and whether it causes diabetes in patients and all sorts of things. Um, but I think, um, you know, it might be um, appropriate or pertinent at some stage to do another um, 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 seminar like this or question like this, it, particularly, you know, in a lot of communities. We have a lot of local authorities with huge um, BAME populations um, that um, you know, want to questions to be answered and they want people that they trust to answer the question and engage with them in an honest way um, and not see them as you know, um, against the system or against the vaccine, but as you say, um, engage with them on the basis of agency. And I think if we could we could do that, I think we will really be able to um, reassure people about the differences. And it was really important to hear that the vaccine cannot change your DNA. That is one of the biggest issues oh, you. around. Uh, you know, I have heard it hundreds of times. You know, I've heard people phone up, they go to the church, they phone the ministers. Is it true that the vaccine um, is altering your DNA? And I will I be turned into something like a zombie or no, some no. Um, different person? So it's really important um, that you have re um, answered that particular question and um, assure people about the differences between the, the two um, um, vaccines. And, and some people uh, do their second dose of the vaccine. They're very apprehensive, um, particularly people with sickle cell anemia. 
Um, they're not sure whether to take the second dose, if it will be harmful. They're hearing about blood clots and the um, um, European Medical Agency have said that they could not rule out a link, but they did say on the balance of probability, it's better to get the vaccine and because the benefits outweigh the risk. So people, um, and they've been told as well, if there's bruising in the vaccine area, um, then they should actually see their medical, seek medical advice. And if they have a headache for more than four days, yeah. they should seek uh, medical advice as well. So more information um, is coming out that will reassure people, but you have done a brilliant job. You, um, Dr. Palmer Mitchell and Acker today in, in answering all of these pertinent questions that black workers wanted to have answered. So I want to say a huge thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I hope that, you know, we will be able to call upon your services at some stage in the future um, in a bigger forum yeah. to, you know, with a lot more. No, this the community needs to hear from you on these issues because you, um, I'm not sure whether this video will be on YouTube or what where it's going to be, but you know the black community, and I can say that I have been engaging with a lot of people in their 80s, over 50s, who will not take it under any condition unless you know they have these question answered about a change in your DNA and all these different things in terms of gene editing and whether they can inject things into your body that turns you into a different person and all sorts of issues. And, and that comes from a good place yeah. because of people's experience. And I've, I, I've already yeah. confirmed that, you know, we do not dismiss people's um, concerns, we answer their concerns. So I want to say a huge thank you to you all on behalf of the TUC no. and the TUC Black, um, Black Workers Committee as well. If there's anything that you want to say in final before we close, then yeah. that's fine. Thank you, Gloria. And, and, and yeah, the slides are available. And I should point out, with, with a number of slides, we've actually put links to references. So okay. folks can go and have an informed decision. If there's a way, I don't know, there's a couple of points I want to raise. Um, we, a, a few of us, myself, um, uh, Mr. Terence Channer and uh, Dr. Jackie McLeod, she's a GP in South London, we produced a fact sheet. So we, we in collaboration with a number of of faith leaders from black majority churches, um, there was this concern. So we produced a fact sheet. Um, I will see if there's a way we can get that to, to your organization. Uh, perhaps I can pass that on to Wilf or, or whoever. And you know, then that can be distributed. But that fact sheet has been endorsed by a number of black majority churches and including uh, health professionals such as Donna Kinnear. Um, uh, and finally, I'd just like to put a plug uh, if I get a chance, I know William and I uh, have got a couple of events. Um, uh, <laughs> I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we we're about to say the same thing. I was so, going to ask if the slide deck could just come up and go to the final slide. Yeah, if you could go to the final slide, please. Please do. <laughs> you would like to plug something if it's possible. Oh, don't you just plug it? Doesn't matter to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, so I, I, I'll plug one event and, and then maybe William can plug his very important event. So I'm part of a charity known as Reach Society. We're an organization of, of black role models. Um, and on between the 6th and the 9th of April, so four days, we're having a, a careers conference. Uh, the idea is to inspire young people. Um, and what we have over those four days are all different activities. So one day we're gonna have around 80 or so black role models. Great, the slide's up. Um, uh, and uh, following day, we're going to have a host of employers. Uh, another day, we, we're going to do workshops around empowerment, CV writing, interview skills. And then in the following day, we're going to have, um, I think Wayne is involved in some of these as well. Um, we're going to have a STEM panel um, of, again, uh, people from um, minority background who uh, worked in various sectors talking to young people about pathways of success. It's free um, and it's open to anyone from the age 13 upwards. So it's an entirely free event. You can register for any or all four of those days. Um, uh, and you can get that to as many young people as possible. That would be great. Okay. That 
is absolutely brilliant to give so much back to the community and to give so many opportunities to people. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know people who have had so many good grades and things like that, who are struggling to get opportunities in terms of, you know, finding the right yeah. pathways to success. So what you're doing is really important and we will publicize it yes, very and, widely. And, and, and talking of that, I know some of the organizations that will be there, Network Rail, TFL and others, they will be offering employment opportunities and apprenticeships. So, <laughs> you know, okay. if, if you're coming, we want you to offer the young people opportunities. So it's a free event. So please do. And we've also got a number of other universities, including my own. I know Imperial are coming. Again, giving young people an opportunity because they see these top universities and they may be a bit daunted by them, but um, they want to open their doors to as many and successful young people as possible. Um, so they're part of de demystifying that myth. So um, four days, free to register. So please do come along. Yes. Okay. Please send the information to Wealth, um, in or you know, or um, and um, and and uh, you you call it Reach Society. Yeah, Reach Society. So you can okay. even go on our website. And yes, we will. Yeah. Okay. There. Thank I'll you for. To Wealth. Yeah, that was that's really brilliant, and it's excellent to see that you are giving um so many um opportunities and you are lifting others as you rise that's what we i always say that's what we have to do you know um open doors and open opportunities for people um to excel and to achieve their aspirations and ambitions so thank you very much for that any final words from anyone else yes yeah, so can i just um so you had the read society one and then the other side if you put up the slide again you've got um Backpack, um, success secrets. So we so next Saturday at seven thirty, we have a uh, professor Jason Arde. Um, couldn't read, I think it was up to the age of eighteen. Then gained his PhD by the age of thirty. So a brilliant, inspirational black success story. Yeah. So each month we hold an event, the last Saturday of the month, and then so next Saturday would be Jason Arde. And then in April, the last Saturday in April, we'll actually be having a, another critical conversation, the state of black health across the African diaspora. So um, um, academics, health professionals from across the African diaspora talking about the state of black health um, globally. So again, please, if you just Google Black Pack, you'll get that information. Or you can always email me directly. I'm happy to pass that information on. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you so much for that. Yes, yeah, certainly, we've got one of the biggest networks in terms of um, um, Black people um, in the community as well as in trade unions and in the workplace. So we will certainly get this information out. You might be inundated with um, people wanting to come in, um, and but I think it's a really good opportunity. So thank you all for your presentations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for an excellent and most informative. The responses I've been getting on the emails are very good. People said it's the best and most informative medical session that they have ever engaged with. And I'm talking about professionals, people who work in, in very professional roles in health and social care and elsewhere and um, so they're very informed on, on things and you know they said to me to give you pass on their very good wishes and to thank you all for answering so comprehensively clearly and honestly the issues um, that have come up and that they wanted answers to so all the very best enjoy your Sunday and enjoy the rest of your time and Stay safe and keep up the good work. And thank you again on behalf of the TUC and the TUC Race Relations Committee and Black workers. No, thank you, everyone. And black thank communities. You. Thank you for hosting And on my team. behalf as well, thank you so much. And I'll be in touch. Yes, I just, wanted to thank the, I just wanted to thank the two young ladies who have been doing the sign language. Yeah. All right. Because I, I was motivated by seeing them when they were being, they were fantastic, absolutely brilliant. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Oh, right. Thanks. Yes. Thanks to all signers and thanks to the TUC team and all the people behind the camera yeah. and also to Wealth as, and the office staff who have made this um, conference a success. Um, and thanks to all of your participants over the last three days. 
um, for their engagement and for their involvement and for all of the workshops that we have done. So it's been a very successful TUC Black Workers Conference and we hope that next year we will be able to do it physically in person, but if not, we will continue with social media and let's hope that, you know, this COVID leaves planet Earth and it doesn't come back. As people are saying, we don't want to have this as a, a vaccine every year as the annual flu vaccine. So a lot of people are praying very hard, especially this Lenten season before Easter um, to, you know, to get this um, COVID off planet Earth. So let's join them in, you know, praying for it to go away as quickly as possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Thanks. Bye. Thank yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.